should have waited. You just doing one. Is wider than snow. I believe Jesus saves, and his blood washes wider than snow. I believe Jesus saves, and his blood washes wider than snow. Jesus. 
Jesus' blood can make you clean. For he saved the worst among you. When he saved the rest like me. And I know, yes I know, Jesus' blood can make the vile sinner clean. And I know, yes I know, Jesus' blood can make the vile sinner clean. And I know, yes I know, Jesus' blood can make the vile sinner clean. And I know, yes I know. Amen. Good to have each of you here. <clears throat> Most of all, it's good to have the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I said, Amen. Good to have the presence of the Lord. Amen. What would a, a gathering like this be if God didn't come and visit with us? But He said, where two or three are gathered in His name, He'll be what? In the midst. Amen. And we've gathered in His name. Amen. 
Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer as we begin the service today. And uh, let's just ask God to have his way in the service. Does anybody have a special need that we need to join you in praying about? Just let it be known by an uplifted hand. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer, I want you to call that, that need out to God. And we're going to agree together in faith that God will intervene for you. Amen. Father, we're so grateful this morning for your love and your mercy. And God, I join with each of these that have raised their hand. And Lord, I know that there's a lot of needs that's represented with those hands that's being lifted. And I just join with them, God, in faith believing today that you have heard their prayer. And God, that you'll intervene and you'll do the miracle that's needed, God, in and through their life. I know that you're able and I believe you to do it, God, that there'd be a testimony to come back that we prayed on this particular Sunday morning and we agreed together and God, that you came on the scene for each one of these, Lord, that had lifted their hand and as they expressed that need to you, we ask, Lord, that you'd do that miracle for them. And Lord, we, we beg for your anointing and your power to be in this service this morning that you would come down and touch each of our hearts and our lives. Lord, I pray you would save that one that's not saved, that one, God, that maybe has backslid and got away from you, that you would deal with their heart, have mercy upon their soul today, and deal with their heart, God, that they might return to you and have their sins put under the blood of Jesus. I just pray, God, that you would do that that's needed in this congregation and this body of believers that you might bless this church, God, to make it to grow, God, in number, and to make it to grow in righteousness, God, that we would become righteous people, that we'd live the way you want us to live and be what you want us to be. God, we ask you to forgive us. Our nation, Lord, is in a mess. We ask, God, for your forgiveness for our nation as we confess the sins of this nation, God, and all the leaders that have been involved in it. I know this nation, God, has gone the way of the world. And I know you destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for the sin that this nation has taken up. We ask, Lord, today that you would intervene for us, that you would have mercy upon us, and, God, that you would save this nation, that it would turn back to you, that it be a godly nation, Lord, we come against the powers of Satan that sought to destroy this people and this nation, God. I just pray you do a miracle, Lord, in behalf of uh, America. And God, we pray especially for Souls Harbor Church and its people that we would be a light, God, in this dark hour. I just ask, Lord, for your will to be accomplished this morning. We beg for your anointing and your power to be present to save and to heal and to deliver and do miracles in the lives of your people as you as you come by and visit with us today. We just love you and we praise you today, Jesus. We've come together to praise and to worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Could you just give the Lord a good clap offering? Oh, Lord, we love you. We love you, Lord. We worship you today. Hallelujah. Remain standing. Brother Steve going to lead us in some singing. We're going to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms today. Amen. Are you leaning? Amen. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. And what a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning, 
leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. And oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarm. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And what have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Hallelujah. You may be seated. That's what we're doing is leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. You may be seated if you'd like to. <clears throat> Just want to say that we're glad to have... Uh, our guests with us today if we we have well it, i don't think we have any uh first timers but we've got some that's been out for a little while we're glad to have each of you back good to ha have sister mary price with us today i've been praying for you sister mary like you has gone somewhere and here you are amen we're glad to have you talking to you yes amen praise god oh uh, <clears throat> At this time, we're going to receive the morning tithe and offering, give you opportunity to give. And I appreciate you for your faithfulness in giving to the Lord. I preached Friday night on uh, righteousness, doing what's right. And one of the things was doing what's right in the church. You know, for people to do what's right. And, of course, we have... Uh, we have righteousness in being willing to teach and to work, uh, to pay tithes, giving offerings. And there's a lot of people that's just righteous in some areas. But thank God for this people that you're righteous in all of this. I believe that. I believe God is going to use us like we haven't been used before. Uh, Brother Wells, would you pray over the tithe and offering?
Thank you for your giving, and the Lord will bless you for it. Amen. Uh, I love being with people that uh, put God first. Amen. Because if you're running with the right crowd, you'll make the right choices. Amen. Uh, but I just appreciate you folks so much and, and trust that God's going to do something great in, through, in and through your lives. We had a wonderful day yesterday out uh, visiting and uh, got to pray with several people. And I know, I know a lot of times when you pray the prayer of salvation with someone, uh, it's just planting a seed. I realize that. But you can't tell when it'll come up. You know, as when, somebody, when someone says, Lord, please forgive me. I'm a sinner, and I'm lost, and I'm asking you to save my soul. Uh, God hears that. Amen. They may not be totally ready to surrender their lives, but God intervenes, and He starts working in their behalf. And I uh, got to pray with several people yesterday, and it's just uh, it's such a privilege. And I preached here uh, couple of Friday nights ago about uh, Jesus talking about when the disciples came and they tried to get him some, give him some food and he said I have food to eat that you know not of and until you've helped someone else you never get to experience that food that I'm talking about but when you pray with someone else and you help them boy there's food to eat that you don't you the world doesn't know anything about now I'm just encouraging you that you make it a practice to pray with someone or to talk to someone about the Lord, to encourage them. You pour water on the seed or you plant the seed. And through this, you'll be eating food that the world don't know nothing about. Amen? Hallelujah. Uh, <clears throat> in uh, the near future, we're going we're gonna to make some changes on our Wednesday night service. We're going to start having uh, Sunday school. Uh, well, it'll, it'll be for the... Hopefully, it'll be preaching and teaching in all the uh, all the classes. But uh, we're going to need some uh, teachers, nursery work, nursery workers. We're we're missing some people that would come that's got children, but because we don't have anything for them, uh, they're choosing not to come, and we want to correct that. Amen. Because we want to reach souls for Christ. Right? Amen. And we want to grow as Christians. Amen. Uh, we're just practicing for heaven anyway. Are, are, are y'all with me today? Amen. From the cradle to the grave, you're just getting ready, making preparation of where you're going to spend eternity. Praise God. At this time, Sister Tracy is going to run up here and uh, she's going to sing for us. Well, I thought she was going to run. She's probably not. <clears throat> Amen. Brother Bloom, stand and testify. Give, the wor give a word for the Lord. Amen. Can't beat that. Amen. Praise God. Sister Tracy, you want to testify before you sing? I love the Lord, and I'm thankful for everything that... He's done for me, and uh, Brother Gary and Pastor Thomas have always said that we're either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or we're heading into a storm. And uh, anybody in here right now that's in a storm, so many of us right now are, are dealing with things, and we're going through a storm, or we're coming out of a storm. But one thing that I'm grateful for is that the Lord never, ever leaves us. He never forgets us. And, you know, he, he always works it out. He always fixes it. Sometimes he fixes it in ways that we don't want, but God always, always fixes it. And so I love the Lord, and I'm thankful that no matter what I'm going through, he, he has a promises in his word that he'll never leave us and that he will never, ever forsake us. You know, so worship the Lord with me as I sing this song. So I'm going to have you all stand up. Because I'm standing up, so I want all y'all to stand up. I want y'all to worship the Lord with me as I sing this song. And so, um, mm -hmm. 
You may be down and feel like God has somehow forgotten that you are faced with circumstances that you can't get through. Right now it seems that there's no way out. You're going under. But God's proven time and time again that he'll take care of you. And he'll do it again. He'll do it again. If you'll just take a look at where you are now and where you've been, hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same now as then. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. God knows the things that you're going through. And he knows how you're hurting. You see, he knows just how your heart has been broken in two. But he's the God of the stars, the sun, and the sea. And he is your father. He can calm your storm, and he'll find a way to fix it for you. Hallelujah. And he'll do it again. He'll do it again. If you'll just take a look at where you are now and where you've been. Hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same now as then. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. That you're going through, and he knows how you're hurting. You see, he knows just how your heart has been broken in two. But he's the God of the stars, the sun, and the sea. He is your father. He can calm your storm, and he'll find a way to fix it for you. And he'll do it again. He'll do it again. If you just take a look at where you are now and where you've been, hasn't he always come through for you? He's the same now as then. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. He's still gone, and he will not fail you. He's still gone, and he has not changed. He's still God, and he's fighting for you. Just like Daniel, just like Moses, just like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, he'll do it again. He'll do it again. If you'll just take a look at where you are now and where you've been, hasn't he always come through 
for you. He's the same now as then. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. You may not know how, you may not know when, but he'll do it again. Hallelujah. Praise God. And that's what he does. He comes through for us. And uh, then we'll get into a little stiffer battle the next time. Uh, if you just remember, he came through last time. He'll come through again. This time we're going to dismiss the children to Children's Church. I want to say thank you to all of our Children's Church workers. Amen. Amen. And also I want to say thank you to our nursery workers for keeping our nursery. Amen. Got some beautiful children. And our bus ministry is growing, and it's going to continue to grow. Amen. Amen, amen. I want to, I want to say just a little bit about this election that's coming up. Uh, <clears throat> I know... Uh, we had a civil war here a number of years back, and I think there was over 600,000 people died in that, that war. And uh, we're on the verge of another civil war. I don't know whether it'll go to the bloodshed or not. It, it's possible. But uh, we're, we're at a place to where people have to make a decision if they're going to stand for right, or they're going to fold up and go with the way that uh, it's being pressed. And, and all, the, all the people that's Democrats are not bad. But there's a few that is really leading this, this country as far as fighting against our police, uh, destroying property, and all the turmoil that's being created. But uh, you need to be to where that you get involved in voting. You really do. You need to be to where you talk it up with your family, uh, just like I'm talking to you about it. Uh, if there's ever a time for Christians to stand up, this is it. Uh, it it's not going to affect uh, Sister Thomas and myself that much because we're fixing to be out of here if the rapture doesn't take place. But it's going to affect our kids. It's going to affect our grandkids, our great-grandkids, the future it's going to affect all of them. And it's time for God's people to stand up and be counted. Amen? I'm talking about take a stand for right and righteousness. Oh, I preached on righteousness Friday night, and you need to do what's right as far as voting. You need to be to where that you get involved in this because it's the future that you're going to, whether you're going to live in this country, or the country we have been living in, or are you going to live in a socialistic society? Amen. And if you want to check out how a socialistic country is, uh, Venezuela would be a good, a good one for you to look at. Cuba would be a good one for you to look at. They, of where they, they try to take from everybody taxes. Taxation will be the highest that you've ever seen it. Because they have to tax people in order to be able to give to people that don't work or don't do anything. I'm on my political horse, aren't I? Hey, you need, you need to hear what I'm saying. God's people need to stand up and be counted. Amen. You need to be counted for righteousness. Amen. Well, without any further ado, Brother Gary's going to come and going to preach for us. I told Brother Gary that for the next couple of weeks I was going to be preaching on Sunday morning, but uh, I'm going to be gone probably the balance of, uh, of November, uh, going to convocation and, <clears throat> huh? Yeah, what did I say, November? <clears throat> well, uh, October. Yeah, the balance of October. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, Brother Gary's been doing some great preaching. I was so in hopes. I was so in hopes. Yes. Amen.
Amen. He deserves, he deserves that hand clap. Uh, <clears throat> I was so in hopes that uh, the trucking industry would show up in this time that I had uh, put him preaching for the last six weeks. But uh, we just believe in the Lord that they will show up. They just hadn't thus far. Brother Gary, come take your liberty in the Lord. Amen. Brother Thomas talking about our letting our voices be heard. It was a pastor in Germany, Martin Nemoller, that said, first they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unions, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Let that sink in just a minute. Who's going to speak for the unborn? Who's going to speak for the innocent? Who's going to try to stand up and hear those voices from history, our founders? All those soldiers that bled and died so that we might have the liberties and freedoms. It's our turn to speak for them. And um, there is a silent majority. I have to believe that. I have to believe that this country has still a foundation of people that's not going along with all this mess. And I just implore you to let your voice be heard. And uh, vote, speak out, use all the influence you can to try to stand for righteousness. Amen. Amen. I want us to... You don't have to stand, but if you would help me sing. Amen. I'd like for us to sing that chorus. We have come into His house and gathered in His name to worship Him. Church is about a lot of things. Church is about seeing people we love. Church is about the fellowship. Church is about hearing the Word preached. Church is about singing. Church is about family. Church is about a lot of things. One of the things that church is definitely about is having relationships with people whereby we can work out our Christian values. The Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man, the countenance of his friend. So church is about a lot of things. But the thing that church is most about, it's about a place of worship. We've come here today to give God praise and to worship Him. So if you would this morning, let's make time for that. And as we sing, would you just try to get in a mindset of worship and let's give God praise this morning. Amen. We have come into His house gathered in His name to worship Him. Oh, yes, Lord. We have come into His house gathered in His name to worship Him. Oh, we have come into His house gathered in His name to worship Christ our Lord. So let's worship Him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's forget about ourselves. Let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on Him 
and worship Him. Lord, help us to do that today. Oh, let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on Him and worship Him. Oh, let's forget about ourselves and concentrate on Him and worship Christ our Lord. So let's worship Him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Why don't you just think right now about something that the Lord's done for you that you're truly grateful for and just slip a hand up and tell Him you love Him and you appreciate Him for that. Oh God, we love You this morning. Lord, we thank You Thank You for all Your blessings. Thank You for Your protection. Thank You, Lord, that You loved us when we were unlovable. You was willing to die for the ungodly and the unrighteous. You was willing to die for the wayward, Lord, and the rebellious. Thank You, Lord, that Your love and Your mercy covers a multitude of sins. I love You this morning. I appreciate you, Heavenly Father. I thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done. We love you, Lord. Receive our praise. Receive our praise. Let it be a sweet-smelling savor to you. Oh, we worship you, Jesus, and we glorify you this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. If you would, stand with me. And uh, I'd like for us to turn, if we would, in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. I want to read one verse of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6. Is it up there? Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. I'm going to use that as a text verse this morning. And, uh, well, I'll let you sit down here in just a second. Let's pray before we do. Lord, we just ask that we commend the rest of this service into your hands. Lord, I need the anointing from on high. Lord, let no flesh glory in your sight. Lord, I'm a weak and frail individual. But Lord, if you could come and you could help us, people could receive help today, and let that be what happens as we embark upon Your Word today. In Jesus' name, Amen. You may be seated. I want to... I, I told my wife this morning, I, I said, I have, a, I have a wonderful, wonderful thought. I really believe Lord-directed thought. And um, I hope and pray that I can present it to you in a way that would both educate you, but more importantly, create a hunger in you uh, for for more of God. That's that's my desire this morning. Uh, some of this will seem maybe like teaching, but uh, please bear with me because I hope you have a hunger this morning. The apostle here writes to the church at Corinth, and the book of First Corinthians was all about correction. The Corinthian people were in a very modern city. Uh, according to the day, you know, the times that were there. And there was all kinds of uh, uh, just worldly influences in the church. So much so that, that uh, they were justifying um, all kinds of sinful behavior. And Paul writes 1 Corinthians to correct a lot of that in the church. And um, so much so that he felt horrible that he had to be so stern. As a matter of fact, he starts off the book of 2 Corinthians by saying, I don't want to come to you and write those things. I don't want to have to 
to, to be harsh. I don't want to have to be direct. I'd, I'd like for us to have a better time. And I, I just thought many times that the preacher feels that way. Uh, sometimes he feels like, well, I had to say something that I know was, uh, it was tough to take. But um, then he, he in, in along about chapter 3 here, he starts to address this whole um, New Testament and Old Testament debate and what, uh, what is going on there. And uh, he, he says here, he said, Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament? He said, God has brought us to this point so that we could step into this, this uh, spirit-filled life and there's a new covenant. Jesus died on the cross and shed His blood and now there's not a need for us to, to uh, kill bulls and lambs and rams and doves and, and do all of that sacrimonial uh, law. We are now under a new covenant. And so he's addressing that, and he goes so far as to say that, uh, with, he said, uh, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, there have been in modern times people who have taken this verse to d disannul all of the Old Testament and say that the Old Testament is the letter of the law and it just produces death and there's no need for the letter of the law. We're now in the New Covenant and the New Testament and so uh, we don't need to focus on the Old Testament. We don't need to have anything to do with the Old Testament. We just need to embrace the promise, embrace the Spirit-filled life and embrace uh, what's ahead because there is no need now for it. We can put that behind us. Now, that is bringing me to my title. I want to preach to you this morning on the right balance. Or another way to maybe say this, both are necessary. Now you might say, well, Brother Gary, didn't it just say there that the letter kills but the Spirit giveth life? I want to show you something this morning that I think will get you to a place of appreciating both the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Amen. So the necessity of both the letter and the Spirit. Go with me to Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. You might want to get your Bibles out. Uh, Bryce will get it there as quick as he can, but uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, the Bible says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. If you read chapter 7 of Romans, he is establishing the fact that he needs to, uh, we're under grace and that the law was, uh, you know, he, he just reimbursing or, or reinforcing the, the, um, the scripture that the letter kills. And, and so people have made the assumption, so, so then we don't need the law. And he said, God forbid, God forbid. Um, I, I wish... I wish, I'd, uh, I wish I would have uh, looked it up. I believe it's Psalm chapter 92. Brother Steve, you got your, 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 your phone on your, your Bible? Turn, turn to, see if you can find, while, while I'm going along here, and, and see if, it, uh, if, if that's the, the, the chapter where it talks about the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Uh, but, but let Brother Steve do that. Y'all stick with me here. I'll come back to him in a minute. So, so Paul is saying... He said some would make the assumption because we're not under the law, we're under grace because uh, the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. Some have even said that, uh, that uh, sin is, is I mean, the, the, the law, it just produces death and it just produces uh, a guilt and it just produces shame and condemnation. And so therefore, the law was uh, sin. And the apostle here said, nay, God forbid. And the reason he said that is because God doesn't change. God didn't wake up on the resurrection day and say, you know what? I'm, 
I, I've changed my mind. I, I used to have a stance on this, and now I've changed my mind. God don't change His mind. What was wrong 5,000 years ago was wrong 50 years ago. It's still wrong today. Amen. What God looked for in the Old Testament, and by the way, let me prove this to you. The Bible says of Abraham, and Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. So long before the new covenant ever got here, God was still looking for belief in the hearts of men. God was looking for people to exercise faith in God way before the new covenant ever got here. So God has not changed. Now God had to lead us to a point where we was ready to receive the new covenant he had to bring us to a place where we could embrace and comprehend the new covenant. He had to lay a foundation, but both are necessary. In John chapter 16 and verse 12, John 16 and 12, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. What's the Spirit going to lead you into? Come on, talk to me. All truth. Who is Jesus? I am the way, the and the life. The Bible says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God and all things were made by Him. What is Jesus referred to there? The Word. The Word of God. So the Spirit is going to lead you into a full understanding of what? Current events? He's going to lead you into a full understanding of the Word of God. Brother Steve, was that the, was that the chapter? Psalm 19. Uh, would you find that? I'd like for you to read it for us. I'd like for you to read it's, I think the chapter is only like eight or ten verses. I want you to read the whole chapter. Try to read it loud if you would. Hang on just a second. Bryce, let me give him this. I want you to hear this. We might just have some readers. Read it if you would. The government showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoicing. As hold the on, hold on. Does that not sound like New Testament to you? Fast forward over into Revelation. This is in Psalms. Listen, catch this. What is the church? We're the bride of Christ. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to establish in your mind today, yes, there is an old covenant and there's a new covenant, but just because we're in the new covenant don't mean that, that we do away with everything we learned in the old covenant. Read, read on, Brother Steve. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The okay. commandment... Hold on just a second. Go, go back to that. The law of the, the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And then what does it say? Testimony of the Lord is sure, making the, wise the simple. What's the testimony of the Lord? The word, our word testament comes from testimony. It, it's things that were... It's history. It was what was written down. It was the way that God interacted with man. That was the testimony. And, and the testimonies of the Lord are sure... What do they do? They make the wise the simple, right? Read on. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. 
More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Now, I wanted to draw your attention to what the psalmist said there when he said, The law of the Lord is perfect. The apostle here said, The letter killeth. It seems like a contradiction. It seems like that there's a change made. But not until we understand the whole con, uh, uh, context of what's, what's being said and dealt with here do we grasp this truth. We need both the law and the Spirit. Amen. In Psalm, I mean John 16, 12, he said here that... Uh, Howbeit, or in verse 13, howbeit when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. What that would imply to me is until the spirit came, there was not a full understanding of what God was trying to communicate. The spirit is needed just like the law is needed. You can't please God without the law. You won't know how to please God without the law. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 23, Galatians 3 and 23, 23 it says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to do what? To bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. The necessity of the law was acting as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. I know this is not, uh, it's not shouting material, but I'm going to teach you something this morning. Just because we're in the New Testament does not mean... That the Bible says that Jesus did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. If you really want to know what Jesus thought of the law, read Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you've heard it been said, and he goes through a few things there. Uh, you've heard it been said, if you uh, kill, you're in danger, in danger of the judgment. He said, but I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're in danger of the judgment. So Jesus didn't come and say, there's no need for that, uh, that teaching. There's no need for that understanding. He came to fulfill and give us the real meaning of what it is. Now, I want to I very briefly talk about the letter only and then the spirit only. And then uh, we'll conclude. The letter only. There's people that they fit into the camp of we just need the letter. We just need the Pentateuch. Our Jewish friends, are, uh, they are, they're, they've not accepted Christ as the Messiah. They fully believe in the Old Testament. They, they believe in the Torah. They believe in, in the Holy Scriptures. But people who have, uh, even in Christendom, uh, emphasized the letter only and they don't focus on the Spirit. They don't, uh, they don't put an emphasis on uh, facilitating the Spirit in their lives. They, they just want to know, that's what the Bible says. You know, uh, th that type of mindset. Uh, what is uh, the people that only have the letter? Romans chapter 8 in verse uh, 1, Romans 8 and 1, the Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them uh, which are in Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of people in our charismatic uh, friends have taken that verse and, and they've just said, oh, we're free. We're free now. We're free. We're not under the law. We're not under the influence of any kind of rules or restrictions or requirements. We're at liberty now. There is there now for no, there is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. What they fail to do is read the second half of that verse. What does it say? 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you're a Christian, you've been born again, and you start walking after the flesh, you are under condemnation. Conviction and shame and guilt does return because God will not, the Holy Spirit will not dwell in an unclean vessel. And we want to be getting our vessel where we are a facilitator of the Spirit of God. This is the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. Amen? And so he, people that just focus on, the, on the, the letter, he said in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was what? What's the next word? Weak. What the law could not do in that it was weak. Didn't say it was of no effect. You know, the Apostle Paul says that bodily exercise profiteth little. And I've heard a lot of people say, well, there's no need to exercise. Well, it does profit a little. Amen. Amen. He said, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in likeness of sinful flesh. Thank you, Braden. And for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. Listen, listen to what I'm fixing to say, and I'll be done with this point. If you just have the letter alone, it leaves you to the flesh to both interpret, for both the interpretation and the application of truth. If all you have is the flesh, I mean, if all you have is the letter and you don't have the Spirit, it leaves you to your own mind to both interpret and apply Scripture to your life. I want to tell you something. It is impossible to please God in the flesh. Did you hear what I said? You cannot please God in the flesh. Is anybody with me this morning? Does anybody have the experience of trying to please God in the flesh? Have you ever tried to do that? Does it not leave you, and I wrote here, which invariably will lead you frustrated or to falsehood or self-righteousness? Those three options you got. Frustration. Oh, I'll tell you what, it's frustrating to try to do the right thing in the flesh. I have vowed vows so many times. I'm not going to say that again. I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to do this now, and I'm going to do that now. And I launch out in the, in the arm of the flesh with, with pure motives, but I don't take time to pray. I don't realize my need for God and intervention. And I don't cry out for His mercy and His help. And I just go, go and try to start, I'm a man, I'm going to conquer this. And boy, I tell you what, you don't go far before you realize that, hey, all you are is a flop in the flesh. We have no confidence in the flesh. Amen. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The one thing we can be assured of if we launch out to do righteousness in the flesh, it's going to become filthy rags. Amen. So the letter alone leads to frustration or falsehood. Or in the case of Christ and what He dealt with in His day was self-righteous people called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus had more frustration with those folks than He ever did sinner people. Didn't He? He gave the strongest rebukes to those folks. You know, you know where the, the Pharisees came from? They, in the beginning, they were a very well-meaning group of people that saw that these laws and precepts were slipping. And the priesthood came together and said, we better hold on to some of this tradition. We better hold on to some of this teaching. Uh, we're letting things slip. And, and, and they were very well-meaning in the beginning. But there was about 400 silent years before Christ stepped on the scene. And in that silent years, there were people that they became staunch in saying, you must do this and you must do that or you're not right with God. 
And they've tried to put practical application to principles, which is a good thing. But in the flesh alone, all it produces is self-righteous people. And self-righteous people is a prideful people. It's a better than you, holier than thou attitude. That's what the letter alone produced. Either that or folks that just totally gave up. This Ruth Beta in, uh, Ginsburg that just passed away, I, I didn't even know nothing about her, but I guess she was the first Jewish woman on the Supreme Court. And the things she stood for and the things that she voted for was definitely not in keeping with, with the Holy Scriptures. The letter alone is weak and it leaves you to the flesh to try to perform righteous deeds. Now let's talk about the Spirit alone. The Spirit alone will produce the same thing. It will produce pride. There are people that they come together in church and they don't care anything about hearing preaching. They don't care anything about what the Bible says. It's all about, whoa, we had church tonight. It's all about the emotion, the experience. It's all about the, 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 the way, well, we spoke in tongues. We shouted tonight. Boy, the Spirit really had its way. And they ain't got no more of a foundation in their Christian living than nothing. I mean, they come and they live like one way on Sunday and then they live like the devil the rest of the week. That, 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 religion, that religion ain't worth a plug nickel. Matter of fact, that religion turns more people off to Christianity than it could ever help. Because whether we believe it or not, friend, the world is looking at the church. They know what Christians ought to be. They may not be doing it, but buddy, they know, hey, the guy I work with claims to be a Christian. Cusses like a sailor. Not so much around me anymore, praise God. But uh, he's of a Baptist persuasion. And uh, we were sitting down in the office here a few months ago and he wanted to know so do y'all speak in tongues at your church? I said, sometimes when the Spirit moves on us, we do. He said, is there an interpreter? And he had the Scripture and verse. Boy, he was all prepared to tell me how we was off base if we didn't have an interpreter. But he blasphemes the name of God, uses God's name in vain, and all this other stuff. And, and I'm like, I hear what you're saying, I hear you. I, I see your lips moving, but they, I don't hear. I don't. I don't really know if I'm getting what you're gathering at. Listen, friends. Hey, the world knows. The world knows what we ought to be. You think, Brother Bloom? You think for one minute, if if Gary Thomas were to go into a cuss and fit on the radio at work, how would that fly? Not too hot. Now the guys, they they some of them would would call me the call me to bear on it. And some of them wouldn't. Uh, some of them wouldn't say nothing. But trust me, they'd know. And uh, they'd remember. Hey, I, I'm just saying to you, folks that just have the Spirit and they don't have no foundation, those folks are prideful, just like the folks that have the letter of the law. They become prideful. There's this whole, we're better than y'all because we speak in tongues. We're better than y'all because we've seen miracles. We're better than y'all because we feel the Spirit. Listen, friends, it's but by the grace of God that we even get to be in His presence at all. Amen. There's no room for pride here. There's no room for arrogance. There's no room for a holier-than-thou, better-than-you attitude. Amen. Amen. I'm just telling you, people that they just focus on the Spirit and they don't want no letter. They don't want no law. They don't want no precepts. They don't want no statutes. They don't want no Old Testament. They think all that is uh, antiquated, out of date. All we need to do is just come together and get in a frenzy and have the Spirit of God. Now, you might say, and I, I, some of the more theological minds here are probably saying, well, Brother Gary, didn't you just read that the Spirit's going to lead us in all truths? Hey, the Spirit will lead you to do a lot of things if you're willing to lead and follow. Can you say amen? 
Amen? However, just because the Spirit comes does not... You see, the problem with folks that, that, that they, they're out of balance and they think that the Spirit is more important than the letter, th those folks... And it sounds like I'm, it sounds like I'm just aggravated. That I'm not aggravated at all. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to teach you something. We need balance. But, but those folks are, they don't care to know and judge and, and try the spirits. They don't, they, don't, they don't want to really let the spirit do its complete work. What they want is they just want the feeling. They're hooked on a feeling. <laughs> Amen. They're hooked on a feeling. And, and, and somehow they feel like that if, if I can feel that feeling, then I know that I'm right with God. Listen, friends. The spirit moving has never been a sign that God's approved. Amen? And I use this example. But Moses, God told Moses to speak to the rock. Moses was mad and he smote the rock and spoke to it and water came out. The miracle happened. The miracle happened. But was God approving? Well, people say, well, it's not the method. It's just, uh, it's just you know, the, the results. It's not the message that's sacred. It's the message. Well, listen, if the method contradicts the message, then you've lost the whole thing. Amen. Oh, this is good. This is good. Secondly, if you've just got the Spirit alone, first, it will produce pride. Secondly, it will reduce Christianity to sense, uh, to. Sensilation. I can't even say the word now, and I wrote it. Sensilation. I'm, I'm stumbling on my word here. Sensationalism. That's it. Thank you. Sensationalism. If the Spirit is all we pursue, it reduces Christianity to sensationalism. Go with me to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 4. Matthew 16 and 4. Somebody say amen when it's up there. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given, it unto, given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. In John chapter 6 and verse 26, John 6 and 26, Jesus said this. He said, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not, or you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Could I just, could I just challenge you to think about something? And I'm, I'm, about to, I'm about to get to the last point, and maybe we'll have some fun here in a minute. But could I, could I just challenge you to something? People that emphasize the Spirit over and at the expense of the Word of God, are those folks not consumed about them receiving? This whole prosperity doctrine birthed out of the charismatic movement. And the focus became on what we're going to receive tonight. What God's going to do for you. We're going to claim this blessing. And I can go with them, Brother Chris, up to a point. Because God does delight to give His children blessings. God, God does take pleasure in, in, in seeing His children to be blessed. I can go with them to a point. But the me-ism, the self-gratification, the I'm going to be blessed, and I'm going to have a new car, and I'm going to get this, and I'm going to get that, and that's all me, 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 me. Many of these mega church preachers are nothing more than motivational speakers. It's nothing more than rah rah. You're you're going to be your best self. You're going to you're going to be blessed. You're going to do this and do that. Listen, friends, and I, I want you to be blessed and I want you to feel good about yourself. But hey, listen, uh, the the point being, if there's not a foundation laid, Amen. Uh, well, uh, let me just go right here because I got it. I got it in my notes and I don't want to miss it. So. I, I, the next point is this, law to the proud, grace to the humble. If the foundation 
of fear is not laid, the house of love will crumble. If the foundation of fear is not laid, the house of love will crumble. And the perfect example of that is in the day we live now with child-centered parenting. In the 50s, 40s and 50s, parents spanked their children. They disciplined their children. They taught their children that decisions have consequences and responsibility was laid on everybody and you weren't going to get anything if you didn't work for it. And you had to control your urges. You had to control yourself. And they taught manners. And some, because they didn't do it from a biblical perspective and they disciplined in anger and they dis dis disciplined out of, a, uh, out of a desire to control, those kids grew up in the 70s and 60s and 70s and they said, bless God, I will never lay a hand on my child. I'll never treat my child that way. I don't want my child feeling towards me like my parents, like I feel toward my parents. And so they stopped discipline. Well, guess what? Those kids of those marriages that would lay down in the floor in the grocery store and kick and scream and yank stuff off the shelves until their mom and dad complied with their demands, those folks have grown up now and they're burning buildings. Those folks have grown up and they're destroying our country. Hello? I'm just saying, if there's not a foundation of fear, the house of love will crumble. What is the Old Testament? The law. Thou shall not. I've been reading this week in Numbers and Deuteronomy. And I mean, the, the cities of refuge and how you're supposed to deal with someone who kills someone and, and the avenger of blood and, and, and I mean on and on and on and on and on. God made it very, very, very clear. You do wrong, you pay. My dad said, I remember when I was a little boy hearing him tell the story about when he went to his, his uh, tour in the, in the Holy Lands. And I don't know where it was, Maybe it was in Syria. I don't know where it was. But anyway, I remember him preaching one time. I was just a young, young boy, maybe just preteen. And he's telling this story about that over there, that women and men and children just walked the streets at night and they had total, there was no fear, nothing. And uh, he was telling the folks, he said, the reason that they could do that is because in their culture and in their time, their law was if you got caught stealing, they just cut your hand off. You only got two chances to steal. After that, they done with you as a thief. <laughs> I mean, your thieving days just got ended. Amen. Hey, that fear, though, produced a peaceable society. That fear... It produced an ability for women and children to walk freely at night and, and, and enter. Hey, listen, when we moved here 35 years ago, there wasn't probably once a month somebody got shot in this, in this city. Colorado Springs was a wonderful place to live. Wednesday night after church, we get home. Lauren looks out the window at about 9, 45, 10 o'clock, and somebody's sitting right up in my driveway drinking and smoking in my driveway right next to my right next to my uh, garage door just sitting in their car I, I opened the garage door I run out there and they didn't even see me they're oblivious to me until I got about five feet from the car I said hey and they started pulling off I beat on the side of the car they just drove off and we we found the beer bottle I mean the you know whiskey shots and the and the cigarettes I don't know how long they'd been out there just I guess just pull up in front of my house and decide to get at it I'm tempted to have Bryce read that, that, that meme he, he, he told me this week from Texas. It was pretty sharp. But um, Jesus in the New Testament spoke more about hell than he did heaven in the New Testament. 
I'm just going to read you some scriptures. You, 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 I don't know if you'll keep up with me or not, Bryce, but try. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 10. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth forth, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water and unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's what Jesus is going to do. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 22, But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say of his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the counsel. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of what? Hell fire. I mean, this is Jesus talking. This isn't somebody else. This is what Jesus said. In John, I mean, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 29. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is pro profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right eye offend thee, cut it off. Uh, excuse me, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should be perish, but not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 19, Every tree that beareth not forth, bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Jesus said in Matthew 8 and 12, But the children of the king shall be cast out into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 verse 28 and fear them not which can kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Why did Jesus talk so much about hell? Because he knew that if you, don't, if you build a house of love and you don't have a foundation of fear, friends, your house will crumble. I mean, just ask, answer me this question. What has the church produced now in this generation we live in that's all about love, 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 and there's no fear of God? What has it produced? Has it produced better citizens? Has it produced better Christians? Has it produced more ethical people? Has it produced more righteousness? What has it produced? A self-centered, baby, crying, fit-throwing, bunch of weak... I better be careful. I might get to saying some words I don't really need to say. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I'm just saying to you, God deals with people, law to the proud, but grace to the humble. Law to the proud, but grace to the humble. What do you do when you give grace to a proud man? You just make him prouder still. Oh, you deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve a break today. You deserve that raise. You deserve. No, friends. I, I know I harp at you guys and y'all having to walk through my journey with me. But I'm telling you, if you can stay humble, amen, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. If you can stay humble, how hard is it for these athletes to stay humble? Bryce told me this morning, he thinks in 2024 20, uh, that Kanye West and LeBron James will weren't run for presidents. And I don't know if you guys know who Kanye West is or not, but I'm sure all of you know who LeBron James is. Hey, is it not hard for these, these, these people that, that come out of poverty, that come out of uh, broken homes and bad situations, and you throw millions and millions of dollars at them? I mean, is it not hard for them to stay humble? Remember where they came from? Is it not difficult... 
I don't know if y'all are enjoying any of this, but I tell you what, I'm having fun. The last point is this. Both are necessary. I need the Word of God to be a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. The only way my souls get converted is the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. As a Christian, I ought to hunger for the Word of God. I ought to have a hunger for the Word of God more than I ever have in my life. I ought to want to eat it. It should be more esteemed than that my necessary food. If I don't do anything else in a day, I should want to receive the Word of God. The Word of God is life. The Word of God is truth. The Word of, and by the way, let me just interject here. The Spirit of God will never do anything that contradicts the Word of God. And pumping the Word of God in you is what gives you the discernment of the Spirit. People that do not have the Word of God, they have no foundation of discernment of Spirit. Did, did you catch that? But on the other hand, just like I long for the Word of God, I ought to long for the Spirit of God. Because it's what gives life to the Word. It's what makes the Word come alive. It's what changes a heart. The Spirit of God was breathed into us. At salvation, we were born again. We became living with a new nature. We, with that old nature, uh, it, it, it's a dying process. But praise be to God, the Spirit gives life. And, and, and oh, I'm, I'm leaving all that. I'm just going to come down here and I'm going to say to us, please, brothers and sisters, if one thing Souls Harbor needs, we need a fresh breathing on this congregation with the Spirit of God. We need, that's the reason we're starting to facilitate more worship because we want to invite the presence of God. Because, Brother Joe, if we go through all of this ritual and the Spirit is not active in, in it, it doesn't produce anything. And God knows, I know, I ain't smart enough to manipulate people and work a system and have a plan and make things happen. I need God. It's God that can change hearts. It's God that can give you good desires. Hey, listen, when, they, when you were satisfied to just sin and watch that movie this past week, if the Spirit of God is in your life and the Holy Ghost is prevalent in your thought process, listen, when you go to turn that on, you, you, you'll, you'll, have some, you'll have a different desire. Amen. But me to get up here and yell and holler at you, don't watch that movie, don't do this, don't do that, that ain't going to do no good. You're going to do what you want to do anyway. But if God's Spirit could be welcomed in our hearts and we could say, Come, Holy Spirit, I need Thee. Come, sweet Spirit of God, I pray. Then when we were faced temptation and we were truly, truly, truly in love with the Lord, we'd have more strength to resist. We would have more of a resilience they that walk in the Spirit shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If every day we're saying, Lord, Spirit, lead me. I love the prayer my dad prays every day. Lord, how do you say it? Show me what to do and give me the courage to obey you. I mean, every day it's, it's Lord, let me please you today. I, I was praying the other morning in, in the truck. I was just driving down the road and I was just praying, Lord, use me today. Please use me today. And unbeknownst to me, Brother Bloom, that afternoon, a man called me from a different city. And I got a chance for about 30 to 45 minutes to talk to him about Jesus. Brother Chris, I'm fully convinced that would not have happened if I would not have been saying, Come Holy Spirit, I want you. I don't want to live my life just to make money. I don't want to live my life just to please me and get the, th the toys I want, get what I want in life. I would love it, Lord, if you would come and take up residence in me to a point that you would overtake my agenda, overtake my plans, and you just could be in complete control. 
but the Spirit's not going to do that if we don't make room for Him. He's not going to force Himself on us. i got to tell you, I have a tendency. I have a tendency to lean on the arm of the flesh. And I'm just saying, it, it ain't working out so good. <laughs> it ain't working out so good. But I truly believe if the Holy Ghost, Brother, Brother D.C. Branham, his motto for OBI, Ozark Bible Institute, was, Lord, let this be a place where you could help yourself to young lives. Let this be a place where you could just help yourself to young lives. That's, wouldn't that be great if that's what Souls Harbor was? Just where we all just vowed, Lord, I, I just come to present myself to you. Help, you. help yourself. If there's anything here you want, use it. Anytime, any way, anyhow, just use it. Oh, there's some good things happening, friends. I, I see some good things happening. The V Hill family, I, I just heard recently that they have started a family prayer meeting. Amen. Brother Morgan's moving up spiritually. Brother Dave was going to run off to the lake next week and look what the Lord had to do to him. I'm just kidding you, Brother Dave. Stand with me if you would. Come. Um.